Welcome to the Confluence Podcast. Uh, this is a fun one today. I probably say that to everyone, but we just uh, I've ended up building a great network of people that I've met in the industry, and it's uh, just always a lot of fun to to have them on here and talk about what the exciting kinds of things that they're doing. But uh, today we've got Steve Germano. Uh, I've known Steve for over a decade. Uh, he was at Unify. Uh, uh, ended up, you know, being a you know. People probably always think it's weird. It's like, aren't they a competitor of yours or were they a competitor before on a desk? And it's like, yeah, but we were all, you know, in this industry, everybody's friends and we all get along and, and do a lot of things together. So known Steve for a long time. Uh, he ended up most recently is he's at a, a large engineering firm called iMeg. And um, I just noticed uh, it's probably been about a month ago. He uh, posted on LinkedIn a little clip. Uh, of a internal uh, chatbot AI project that they were doing and kind of showing off some of the success of that. So I just thought it was really cool. Uh, obviously, it's very topical. Uh, this year's uh, Confluence uh, three-day event that we did back in October was all around AI and machine learning. So I immediately reached out to Steve and was like, oh, Steve, this is like the coolest thing. <laughs> Would you come on and, and and you know, let's talk about shows, shows you know, what, what you've done and, and then a little bit of the behind the scenes about how all this came about. So I think everybody will enjoy, uh, he, he agreed to come on and do it. I'm still trying to twist his arm to get him to come to our, uh, our New York event that we're doing confluence event that we're doing in April. So, uh, hopefully we'll get him out for that as well. But I think everybody will enjoy, uh, you know, hearing this episode and, and hearing him kind of dig into what's behind, uh, being able to actually pull off, you know, the technology, but more importantly, the the people aspect of it and how it works inside of a firm like I'm at. I think every firm is kind of thinking about doing this. And so for him to come on the show and show how they've done it so far, what things to look out for, what platform they're building on top of, all of that was really valuable. And I think people will get a lot out of this because we all have experience seeing different firms and all the different departments and how they could potentially benefit from ingesting their data and then having it answer questions in real time to people who have questions, right? So uh, I think that it's, it's really valuable. And iMeg is, is at the forefront of this, it seems like, because they're talking about it and, and showing it off. And, and it seems like a, a really valuable tool. And uh, I, I can only imagine the alternative, right? It's like searching the intranet, looking, going to the HR department, going to the graphics department, trying to find the right person. And like this actually cuts down on a lot of that. And it gives uh, you that single source of truth. But, but him also talking about accuracy and integrity of the data and bias and all of the things that are potentially in there as well and what they're testing against um, is, is also the other part of the story that everybody has questions about and not quite sure how to approach this. And he's giving us some answers here today. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah. And I think, you know, Steve has, it. You know, he'll, he'll, when we kick into the episode, he'll give a little bit more of his background from a, uh, you know, he, he's actually an engineer, but he's turned into a, being able to write code right all along the way. So now he's yep. kind of wearing both these hats and inside the industry. So, um, he's, uh, He's a smart guy, and as you'll see, uh, his willingness to share, you know, what he's learned, and I think it's just a huge benefit to the industry, so appreciate that. So let's just dive right in. Uh, welcome, Steve, to the Confluence Podcast. Um, for those in the audience that don't know Steve, i am been an AC industry guy for several years. Steve and I met each other, probably known each other 10 years. I was thinking back, you know, we... Steve and his team, formerly when he was with Unify, uh, were involved in helping to get the first building content summit going. And that's that's the time I kind of remember I ran down on the floor at uh, yeah. AU maybe back in 2013 or 14. And and uh, we, we have known each other at least since then. So uh, anyway, welcome to the podcast. Um, part, of, uh, part of this has been a series, you know, this um, we've been talking about AI and machine learning and uh, caught my attention a couple of months ago, Steve posted something on LinkedIn that was kind of showing off a new initiative that he's got at iMeg where he works now. So we thought we'd have you on Steve and kind of talk through what's going on on that front. And uh, so welcome to the podcast. Yeah. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. So Great uh, I, I'll, I guess I'll just kind of kick off to ask the question. You, you, you posted a video, as I said, over on LinkedIn and you've got a, a chat bot that you've been developing. Your team has been developing inside of iMeg, which is a large engineering firm. Maybe you can tell a little bit about what the firm does, but um, uh, Meg, I think is what you named your, your bonnet, which yes. is interesting. Yep. We're doing some work here and 
actually just earlier today, somebody was asking, it's like, what are we going to call this? It's like, should we make it, you know, human? Should it be like it's a human or are you talking, you know, generically to something? So we can dive into all of these things and kind of the, the backstory of what's going on there. So maybe you can just kind of kick it off with a little, a little bit more about yourself and how you ended up at iMeg and, and the team that you're running there. And, and let's talk about Meg. Sure, sure. Yeah. So yeah, Meg's Meg's a, a funny story behind that one. But yeah, so a um, little bit about me. So I'm originally a, a mechanical engineer by trade. Um, started my industry, I started in the AC industry for uh, working for RG Vanderwall Engineers in Boston. And I was actually hired uh, as a mechanical engineer in their group, but actually specialized on their CAD department. And so we were doing CAD setup and all these things for every project in the whole company while also doing mechanical design. And I was kind of really just not wanting to do the CAD side of things. So um, naturally kind of gravitated into programming, had done some programming classes previously in school and dove in and, you know, six months later or so kind of pretty much automated the CAD setup process within the, within the company um, and was able to kind of focus more on the engineering side. Um, and while I was at Vanderwaal, uh, actually developed what was known today as Unify, but it was a very ugly version of Unify back then. <laughs> it was a you know pretty simple UI and a, and a SQL database just to manage our BIM content amongst our offices because that was just a need that we found that we needed. Um, and then kind of fast forwarding, that became a business. Um, you know, we had some great partners, and we all kind of built up this Unify product and brand and. You know, just uh, recently, uh, a year or so ago, got acquired by Autodesk. Um, and then I had left uh, Unify in 20, I want to say 20, around, around 2020, 2021. It went back in the industry, uh, working for MSA uh, Consulting Engineers, a smaller firm, about three offices, and um, and basically was uh, got back in the industry as a director of design technology there and was helping kind of revamp that business from design technology perspective, IT and all those things. Um, and then lo and behold, during COVID, uh, we end up getting acquired by iMac and I'm like, well, you guys already have a design tech of technology director. So, uh, where do I go? Right. Um, and so it was a really good fit. We had some, had some great conversations, a lot of leadership. And at that point they were, they had done some programming and had some automations and things going on a lot of dynamo as every firm has, and they really wanted to dive in and, and structure a software development team. So I said, I'm up for the challenge. So I came on board as the uh, the head of their software development team. And uh, we now have a team of uh, six engineers today and um, actively hiring some more as we speak. So it's growing, it's growing rapidly. And it's been, it's been just an awesome time. That's it's been a, a really great company. Ted, Steve, is that, is that rare to see? I mean, a team of six is a pretty good team for whatever size you're. It is. It is. And, and it's actually larger than that if you count in. So there's six core developers today, but there's also product owners, right? And so there's uh, product owners. And then there's also what we call PIMs, which are, um, they are product uh, innovation managers, kind of a new thing we just developed uh, at the beginning of this year. And each department now has a PIM and all they do is think about workflows. And that's like their core competency. Sure. It's like, hey, how do we do X, Y, Z workflows? And then where can we automate this? Where can we share mm. data with other departments? And how do those workflows interactions work with other departments? So they're just thinking about innovation, which is awesome. So they come up with use cases and ideas. Oh, we need a widget for this or a website for that. And then those requirements kind of flow down to a product owner. And then they'll get more technical and spec things out and work with myself to, you know, kind of quote those things and estimate them. And then we actually go and develop them. So it's a, it's a, there's, there's kind of a, a big, investment from, from iMake, I would say, and you know, their goals and how, and their growth, uh, their growth has been amazing they grow through acquisition. So they're, they're active, very actively purchasing two to three firms a quarter, um, sometimes upwards to four or five, depending on the size and kind of filling in the dots across the nationwide map here. So when I started, they were very much Midwest where they had begun. And then they purchased our firm for the Southwest area. They had some West Coast and they they added more there. They then added South and Southeast. And then just recently they've added the Northeast. So we now kind of have a good um, nationwide presence and and they keep growing through acquisition. So it just kind of snowballed the effect of how many more apps and integrations and things people need across the organization. So it's been a really, really fun challenge and great place to work. It makes sense. So let's uh, let's dive into the uh, this AI bot that you've been working on. Big. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, was this something that 
that came through that process from the top down, or was this something you guys were experimenting with? And no, yeah, this was an interesting one. Um, so the the regional need. So so two years ago, I was kind of dabbling around with LLMs when they first came out. Right, DaVinci 3 comes out, and I'm instantly it it you know it got my interest, and I'm like we can now turn language into numbers that computers understand. That was really the big thing about LLMs is like, hey, now this sentence means these 1500 numbers. And now I can compare those numbers with other numbers, which are sentences, other sentences. And it really just, it, it was awesome. Like I, I just dove in and I started messing with stuff in my own time, built my own little chat bot way back in the day. And, um, and no real use case at work, right? It was just, just dibble and dabbling. And then I had a product owner come to me and he goes, you know, I'm going out and I'm doing these site visits and, and talking to our, uh, you know, per office, talking to our offices and we're doing some trainings on our Revit apps. And we have a, we have a Revit app suite of about probably 60 different types of tools. Um, a lot of real small little push a button, execute some things uh, from small apps to some pretty larger ones that do full electrical calculations for entire building, arc flash calculations, some pretty cool stuff. Um, and you know, folks need training, right? So we have these guys go out and do trainings and he comes to me, he goes, Hey, I got done with the training and I'm talking to this team It's a fairly new acquisition. I think they were about six months uh, into the acquisition process and they didn't know about half the tools. They're like, oh man, I had to do this whole workflow and it would be great. We had a tool for that. And he's like, oh yeah, we have one. It's right here. And he's like, and then the, another person was like, Hey, it'd be great if I had a tool for this. Oh like, yeah, we have that. It's right here. So we wanted is he was like, Hey, can we just make a search engine so that people can just say, Hey, I want to do X, Y, Z. And let me just find the tool that we already have. And so that's where it started. So I just like, oh, I can do that. I'll mean, throw that into an LLM. Well, you know, we'll do some AI stuff, no big deal. And it became really easy. It was like a, you know, two, 3,000 line of code app, like really small. I think I did it over a weekend, just messing around to see if I could do it. And then I showed him next week and he was like, oh, that is cool. He's like, what else can we put in there? I'm like, oh, oh, okay, here we go. All right. So, so that that kind of was the beginning of it and it was just a prototype and we were actively working on the project so it kind of just stuck it's just sat there for a couple months and then um you know the the texts are maturing right and then there was that big aha moment when gpt3 came out right and davinci 03 came out and, and all of a sudden everybody's like oh my god chatbot chatbot chatbots right uh opening i was blowing up uh leadership's hearing about this stuff and um you know, and, and our CIO and I were having a conversation about, you know, we have we have a whole data team that works at IMEG and they do amazing work. They're, they're basically doing a lot of ETL pipelines. So they're transforming data, pulling it from one database, putting it into another place, merging data together and building Power BI reports for all these different use cases and people throughout the business, which every AC firm is doing about these days. And they're extremely busy and they're always busy, right? They're always new reports and new data and insights to get from our data. And so we have this great team that's really actively involved in our data. And one of the first things our CIO did when he came on board was, hey, we gotta clean our data. We can't really make any insights in our information unless we have it structured and we know how to actually go and access it. So I was having a conversation with him and you know, we've got content on SharePoint, we've got database for you know, Vantage Point and Salesforce and every firm has 15 different places data lives. And there's no real consolidated location where we kind of bring that stuff together and then be able to query it, right? Uh, without having to go bother the data team and make me do Power BI, right? And so where I was like, well, I think I can consume that data into a chatbot, right? I think there's new things coming out. And I'm, I was always reading white papers as soon as they launch. I'm a big white paper nerd and like, yeah, like I need to get a life. But yeah, so yeah, I love reading those white papers, right? So they come out and it's like, oh, we just developed you know, uh, I think it was Stanford um, that developed the first RAG pattern, where RAG is a uh, retrieval augmented generation. So the LLMs are, um, when they first came out, a lot of problems with hallucinations, making up things, they couldn't do math. They're really, really kind of uh, not very trustworthy, right? And so this RAG pattern came out, was like, hey, I wanna ask questions about this set of information, whether that's a, a paragraph or a book or whatever it is. And if we took that information and we put it in line with the user's prompt and the LLM would read the user's question, see that information, and answer from just that information and not hallucinate. And there's some things you, you know, some, some dials and knobs to turn with the LLM to make sure it doesn't hallucinate when you're given those types of RAG instructions. Mm. And so that, when that came out, I read that white paper and I was like, you know what, I think we can actually do this now because 
my primary concern was, well, I can't release a chat bot that's going to one, say bad things True. to people and get us in trouble. Right. Especially with, you know, so, and, and two, we can't be making up stuff, right? We're talking building engineering, structural, right? I always used to make a joke as an HVC guy. If I made a mistake, somebody's hot or cold. If a structural engineer makes a mistake, there, there's, there's bigger liabilities there. So we want to make sure the data it's retrieving is accurate, right? First and foremost. And with that pattern, it opened up that opportunity. So in that conversation, I was like, I think we got an opportunity here where we can actually execute on this. And we're just like, okay, let's go build a prototype. So we did that prototype and it just kept going. And now here we are. <laughs> so so really uh, the the moment was that the data is there and it's really just freeing up the front end and making it accessible without, you know, having to have a data scientist or somebody, even, you know, even at the level that knows Power BI, it's like, you know, of how to pull all this together. So it sounds like you know, exciting opportunities, I think, across the industry to begin tapping into these data sources like you guys are. What are, what are all the different, uh, what are the different places where the data is living, being sourced? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of them today. And um, there's kind of two buckets. If you kind of think about data in an organization today, there's structured data, which is living in a database somewhere, right? Um, that could be a SQL database that could be via APIs to something like Vantage Point or Salesforce. Um, those data is still in the underlying locations of the database. Then there's unstructured data, which is our documents, right? There's, you know, I don't know how many engineering memos we have on SharePoint or PDFs, you know, code, code documents, things of that nature. And that, that data is very unstructured. And so how do you get the data from all these different sources and bring that in was a real challenge. And it was probably the biggest challenge of this whole tech stack is not only how do we consume it, right? But then as it updates and updates live, I don't want to be asking a question, getting outdated data, right? Mm -hmm. So we had to build a system and architect and infrastructure that as things change live, it can update that data in real time. So you're never getting out of data information. And that was a real challenge. That was probably the the most critical piece to this actually successfully working in the organization. Um, and that involved, you know, being able to, to get all of our, our information and data off of SharePoint, which is mostly the unstructured data, um, as well as tap into, you know, Salesforce databases and our data lake, which our data team ETLs a lot of API data together into a single location. Um, so yeah, a lot of different places. Uh, Vantage Point today, uh, employee directory, which is data structured. Um, you know, all of the, the SharePoint documents, uh, Salesforce Advantage Point, and I think that's about it right now. Uh, oh, Project Database, which I think is a mix. And this is another fun part. Half of our data for projects lived in Salesforce, and the other half lived in Vantage Point. And how do you meld those two together with a singular question? And how do you search across both those singular questions? It's very complicated structures to the data. So... So again, this this whole thing though, with the structured data, would have never been able to like we would have never been able to execute it if we didn't have our data team. And um, one of the things we were able to do with working with that team is saying, hey, if we can, I know this data lives in two or three databases, but if we can make a singular location for that and ETL that data in, it makes it much easier for us to consume and the LLM to consume it. So we did a lot of work with those folks and it really made that that you know that opportunity possible. So you were. Uh... I, I kind of touching on earlier that ultimately with these new, any new technology like this, if people don't trust it, you know, we're talking about the hallucinations and the challenges of, you know, overcoming yeah. those early stage kind of obstacles. And I'm, I'm the same. It's like, I, I don't want to do something. You only get one bite of the apple or one swing, swing yeah. at bat, right? It's like, uh, as soon as somebody has a bad experience. So maybe you can kind of dig in a little bit about how did you all you, you had to prove it out to yourself that it would work, but ha how did you start mm -hmm. to show it to others? What were the data sources? How did you all kind of prove out and make sure that it, that you, one, you were putting something out there that could be trusted and wasn't hallucinating. And then I'm sure once people got a taste of that, they, they were asking, right. To kind of broaden the sources of that info, but maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. The, um, so, so Meg can, Meg basically has access to these different locations for data. So as you ask a question, it goes and gets it and retrieves it and then responds in a human-like way, right? And so um, making sure in how you do your prompt engineering that you're not, that the LLM, you, 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 you make it really safe so it doesn't hallucinate on that data, doesn't make up numbers. 
Um, it, that's a kind of a prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is tricky. It's, it's right now there's there's continual research being done on it. So almost every week there's new white papers coming out with new techniques. And so by telling the LLM very very kind of s simple things like let's think step by step, right? Or um, you know no pros, which don't be verbose. Just give me the information I'm asking for. Those little things in the prompt engineering make a big difference. Um, but as you start to tweak with some of the LLM settings on temperature and top P and those types of you know, technical settings, you can basically tell the inference engine, hey, don't be creative. There's like a creative dial yeah, yeah. in there, if you will, right? And um, as you kind of tweak these dials and you do some of this prompt experimenting, you can find that right marriage. And that is not an easy thing. I'm, I was prompt engineering something this morning. Like, you, you know, it's a continual thing. And as you start, now that we're into kind of a, you know, a company-wide rollout, we're getting a lot more analytics. So you can start to tweak even a little bit more and fine tune. Um, but that's really the, the, the key is, you know, can you get your data in one, but then can you make sure the LLM responds correctly? And if it can't answer the question with the data you provided, most importantly, say you don't know right, the answer. Right. Right. So we've taken the approach and I'll show you in some examples when we get to it, but we've taken the approach of we might not have the information to answer your question. That would just maybe a knowledge gap. And so our product owner is really focused on that now that we have good analytics okay. coming in like, oh, this guy asked a question, but he didn't have the answer. So that's a knowledge gap. Let's go get with our librarians and let's get that information added to the data sources. Right. And so making sure it just says, hey, I don't know the answer, but. Here's what I did find, and let me summarize what I found. That seemed to be really adequate for people um, because it, what they asked may be very vague. And that's, uh, you know, to get to our earlier conversation uh, before we went on, you know, how do people search? That's a, that's a really ingrained thing over the past 20 years of working with Google, right? We, we, we search by keyword types of lexiconal search, right? Where it's like one word, then add another word, add another word. We don't typically search in a conversational way. Right. So LLMs work with a conversation. Right. So the you I, I always say to our product owner, kind of a joke, I say, ask dumb, get dumb, right? Ask smart, get smart. So if you actually put more information into your text query, right? As that gets vectorized, there's more information to compare it with the associated data to get more accurate results coming back. So if you put in one or two words and it's vague, you're not really asking a question and we're doing a search. It's, it's harder for the LLM to figure out what your intent is. And there's lots of tricks out there. There's like, uh, hey, well, as soon as a question comes in, pass it through an AI that just does intent and then pass it to the other things, mm -hmm. right? So lots of tricks out there. I've tried a lot of them. We've settled on, um, we have a couple of different AIs that are interacting at the time you do a question. Uh, acronyms is a big hassle. Oh man, acronyms, man. Whew. That's that's giving me a lot of trouble. <laughs> you know, we are we live in acronym soup as oh, architects and engineers. It, right? it makes yeah. me uh, think about just for, you know, and I hadn't even started thinking about this, but you know, how do you write a test plan if you're developing software with this kind of a front end engine? How do you write a test plan? You now you got to start to say what kinds of questions are people going to ask, and that's yep. basically infinite. And uh, so, how do you right. really test this? Have you all sort of thinking about that from a what, what's a test plan look like for a bot? Right. We thought about it. <laughs> I don't know that we have an answer for it today. Yeah, it's, I've seen some examples um, on kind of the uh, Microsoft development team that I'm part of that does uh, the semantic kernel, which is kind of like their AI engine, if you will. Um, those folks are, are trying to do the same things we're doing right now, right? Everyone's all in the same boat. Yeah. We're developing, getting into production at the same time. And everyone has the same questions. Well, how do we how do we do testing of LLMs? Um, there has been some good white papers put out, and OpenAI released a update to one of their models. Um, I want to say the November release last year, if I remember correctly, where you can now pass in a uh, a GUID for all intents and purposes, and it's basically like an identification token. So when this exact string is asked, and I use this token, the here's the answer. So then when you run your test, same question, same token, should get the very same answer or close to it. Um, and that was actually a key because of this exact question. Their developers on OpenAI's um, you know, third-party developer apps, app developers were asking for the same thing. How do we guarantee um, you know, consistency from question to question? 
And we still struggle with that, right? Like you can ask the same question twice and get, you're going to get two different answers, but the intent might be the same, but they're going to be worded differently. Um, you know, so there, there are some struggles that, that you are going to deal with that I don't think the industry really has a hundred percent, um, you know, kind of worked out, but from a unit testing perspective, using that key is supposed to help the inference engine stay consistent, if you will, go through the same neural network pass. Um, but it's, yeah. it's a complicated we thing. Yeah. It takes a lot of. We ran some of the very similar kind of tests with some of the work that we're doing here internally. And it was, well, when, one of my first questions was like, if you ask, if you feed the same, very same text string in over and over and over, do you get the same answer back or not? And, you know, you don't, you, know, you, you might get yeah. nine, nine times out of 10, the same thing. And then all of a sudden something a little bit, you know, varied comes back. So it, it there's some interesting expectations around that, right? Because we we've we expect a computer to answer it the same every single time, but it's actually like you're asking nine different people nine to, the same mm -hmm. question, and and it's it's just like sitting in architectural design studio, and everybody has the same brief, and you get sixteen different outcomes, right? It's exactly. everybody is applying there, and so it's it's kind of like this, right? It's like if it's searching across all of the possible information that could apply to this and it's this LLM, right? So it's just looking for patterns in words and concepts and things that I, I see why it's coming back differently, but we have this expectation that we're asking a computer something and that it will, will always, it's like, we expect it to be like math, right? Oh, and not like yeah. a conversation because, yeah. and this has come up before, right? But I don't know what the next word I'm going to say is. I, I don't know. I don't know what you're going to say next and you don't know what you're going to say next, but you respond in real time. And that's exactly what's going on with this. And so it's not different, but we have this, this different, we think differently about it. Yeah. When this, when this comes up and it comes up quite often right now, and uh, the, the technical term is called uh, deterministic or non-deterministic, right? Mm. And LLMs are non-deterministic. So every time mm. somebody tries to give me a bug report, I just, I have a meme say that I just send it up to him, non-determinism. <laughs> it's actually from <laughs> opening the eyes quote. What does non-deterministic mean, right? So, it, but it's challenging. So how do you, how, and as a programmer, we're almost kind of retraining our brains because our goal, our job, right, is to it's get deterministic a, outputs. Yeah, 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 100%. So how do you as a programmer retrain mm. your brain to say, hey, you know, now you're going to start using AI and, and not just chatbots. Everybody thinks chatbots, but... You can use a AI planner, right, in a program that may have, well, I'll give you a great example, We're talking about something right now. Uh, when I place an outlet, how do I know what host, hosting behavior should go into in Revit when there's 50 of them, right? Does it go on a wall? Does it go on the floor? Does it go on the ceiling? Does it go to the work plane? Like there's all these different scenarios. Well, when you can't code all those code branches, that's where AI has a great advantage because it's like, hey, I can give you the inputs, let you give you instructions on how to determine your thought process and then give me what you think is the right output. And that that is where I feel like programming is changing right now, right? Everyone's all enamored with chatbots and that's the first first location. But moving forward, how do we use a small bit of AI that may never even be seen by the end user, but it's doing things behind the scenes to just make decisions, right? from a, a a very large amount of potential outcomes, right? That's, a, there's a lot of ML that can do that in a mathematical manner, right? When we start talking about ML algorithms and different things like that. But when you're talking about reasoning, right? That's a little bit different. And LLMs are great at reasoning, especially if you mm -hmm. give them good instructions on what to reason over and mm -hmm. set parameters coming in and set outputs going out. And so OpenAI wasn't really, their models uh, kind of, they're always on the forefront, right? They're always like the best models out, the newest features. They added something last summer called function call. And with function calling, you can say, hey, uh, you can make a decision and call functions based on inputting parameters. And then those functions can give me back set parameters. So no longer are you trying to just parse through text strings and figure out numbers and text strings. It's now actually structured data inputs and structured data outputs. That kind of changed the game for programming where now we can actually use this to make decisions inside a deterministic type of method that mm -hmm. is actually a non-deterministic type of solute or problem that you're trying to solve that I can't code 50 different code paths for, right? 
So it becomes really interesting and it, it's tough. And I, I talk to even my, my dev team about this and you, know, you almost have to kind of retrain your brain as to, okay, we're not gonna use AI in this tool or this new app coming out just for the sake of, hey, let's just use your AI. You gotta be smart, you gotta use the right tool for the job. And it's not great for everything, right? You know, square peg and round hole scenario. It just doesn't fit everywhere. But as we get, you know, the models get better. And as we get better, as we learn more, as we retrain ourselves on how to think, we're gonna find more applications for where an LLM can be used, where things like stable diffusion can be used, these different bits of uh, AI models that are coming out these days. So it's a really exciting time. Um, probably the biggest change in programming I've seen in my entire career. So it's, it's really exciting. And so is Meg built on top of OpenAI's platform? Yes. So today um, we have a couple different models that we use, but we are primarily using OpenAI's models um, and a couple reasons for that. One, they're the most trusted, right? They have, uh, they have a bunch of filters. So if you just go to OpenAI and you chat today, it goes through a bunch of behind the scenes filters there sexism, racism, all the isms, right? Um, it had the political filter, never to make jokes about politics and all these different things. It's just got a lot of behind the scenes things because they've come under so much fire and heat since they've started. They have a ton of protections. You could use open source models for free, for cheap, right? That can do about the same performance wise, but you lose all that. So from an enterprise, right? Hey, money's kind of cheap in that perspective where why not pay for the best product? And it's, what I've been talking with other developers, most people are going that route just because it's easier and it's safer to, today. That may change mm -hmm. over time. There's a French model that came out called Mistral that is uh, amazing. It's, it's performing better than GPT-4 in some areas, uh, definitely better than 3.5, and no one's been able to say that with an open source model. They also have a paid model as well that's uh, comparable to GPT-4, um, but uh, you know the protections are they fall a little bit short on the protections right now. But everyone's catching well, up. Kind of so goes back. It's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of competition in time for sure. Kind of goes back to that you know early stages, obviously with all of this that you you don't want to do anything that's going to break trust because you know, you can one, one misfire one of some type yeah. right freak, freaks people <laughs> out and you just want to try to avoid it if you can. So, yeah, yeah. I mean especially a company wide chat right. Uh, it makes one, you know, racial slur or something, you're getting sued, right? You got to be really careful with these things. That was my biggest concern. Now I was, you know, two years ago, I'm like, it's not ready. It's not ready. It's not ready. And then finally, I'm like, okay, I think we're, we're there, right? The tech's catching up. Um, and that's kind of cool right now. It's like, all right, you want to be bleeding edge, but you don't want to be too bleeding edge because, you know, one, you can waste a lot of investment, right? Sure. Um, and we were kind of really um, intricately thinking about exactly when is the tech gonna catch up in different areas for us to release different features. And so we have some new plugins that are on hold right now. We're kind of waiting for some things to catch up. Um, but there's, there's there's a lot of movement going on right now. And even even Microsoft themselves, are they're launching their co-pilots in all their product stacks. And uh, you know they've got issues too, right? So I, I was just watching yesterday, um, someone demoing the preview version of the co-pilot in Excel. And uh, someone had asked me in my firm, well, how are they doing that? And we're not doing Excel stuff today, right? And I'm like, I don't know, that's going to be really feasible today. And so, and I'm watching this video and this guy's got a million rows of data in Excel file, right? And the co-pilot chokes and just completely locks up and crashes. Then he goes, okay, let me try it with less data. He goes down to half a million rows, crashes. A hundred thousand rows, crashes. Goes down to 5,000 rows, crash. He had to get all the way down to 400 rows before it would actually be able to talk over that data. So, so there's just a lot of, I mean, if Microsoft, you know, has obviously more resources, they, if they're still struggling with some of this tech and how to achieve it, right? Probably good to go put that on hold for a little while. We'll come back to Excel files later, right? So uh, it's just being smart about where you kind of think the industry is and kind of, you know, just, just being tuned in with things so you don't forge too far ahead and waste time and money and effort, so. Well, I think uh, maybe before you just jump into into whatever we're going to do next, I'm hoping I, I want to take a look at this. But I'm just wondering how much of this has has your team shifted from before two years ago to what you're doing now? How, how much has it shifted to AI? A uh, focus on that. Um, not much, to be honest with you. Not not much outside of the Meg product. That's really the only product where we've actively integrated AI today. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry. There is one more, but it was a legacy project that our data team's working on, and that's doing you know points and buildings for um, 
um, it's more natural language processing and it's for points and buildings for uh, control systems. So, so those are really the only two projects I know of today that are actually utilizing any type of AI, if you will, with LLMs. Um, and so like we have other projects that are act in active development that we will be adding some elements into, but I don't think they'll be public facing. They'll more be like I was saying before behind the scenes to do some decisions and things. So, um, so yeah, I guess not a ton today, everyone's conscious of it, but we gotta have the, it's gotta be the right tool for the job. So, um, I appreciate you saying that just because I think because we're talking about this topic, the, the, the mind immediately goes to like, this is everything and this is all that we should be focusing on. And, and so it's, it's, uh, important, I think, to hear what the answer to that question. Yeah, cer certainly not. I and mean, that's a common trap, right? Of, of development teams they find this new shiny object and they're mm -hmm. like oh man i want to go work on this so they can learn it and, and it might have, just might not be the right tool for the job so you got to be really smart with that this episode is made possible with support from chaos enscape enscape is a plugin software that simplifies real-time visualization for us in the architecture engineering and construction industry whether your go-to design application is revit sketchup rhino archicad or vectorworks Enscape lets you instantly create high-quality renderings by syncing data from your 3D model without additional import or export needed. Easily navigate every aspect of your design in real time and identify and resolve any issues you come across quickly. Plus, you can immerse your clients in VR to provide a tangible sense of the project. Enscape is the trusted choice of over 500,000 monthly users across 150 countries. They are soon launching something special that will make your 3D workflow the best 3D workflow for a special price. In the meantime, you can experience it for yourself for free at chaos-enscape.com slash trial-14 or simply by Googling Try Enscape. Thanks to Chaos Enscape for their support of this episode. And now let's get back to the conversation. So do you get to... Can you show us? Can you show something? Yeah. Let's take a quick yeah, look. absolutely. So this is Meg, and you can see it's kind of my chat history. Been asking her some questions here and there. Um, let's ask. We've got some questions. I'll just copy and paste in here. So one you of say, the things you say her, say, you say her. I just want to point out that like you are personifying <laughs> this, and, and I'm just wondering. Naturally. Is it natural? Yeah. Like, is that it, was that it important? Is. is that something that comes up in conversation? Well, like culturally in the firm it's a it's a funny thing so i'll tell you the backstory um there was no name and i had somehow in my early version of it i had named it megatron right just from you know being a being a, a nerd there right so and then when we sent off some information to marketing like can you give us a logo or you know i i there was no persona there was no meg name our market, one of our marketing people came up with it and just like, Hey, what do you think of this? Perfect. This is the first iteration, only one iteration. And we we're like, it's better than Megatron. And, <laughs> and then it just took on a life of its own. Right. And now people personify, hi, thanks, Meg, that, you know, they're talking to it and the, it's really funny to watch the analytics because you can see people have conversations, which is really cool. They're appreciative when they get an answer and they say, thank they're you. Nice and says, you're welcome. Let me know. <laughs> they're nice. Yeah, yeah. It's really, they're it's not really the fun. ones who are going to go kick the robot because they know the robot will come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a smart move. I'm very polite to Meg. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so you can ask, uh, you can just start typing and ask a question um, in the, in the, there's two ways to kind of interact with it. You can just type, like you can see here, can you explain Ashray ventilation 62.1, right? Um, or you can call a plugin directly. And so what we did was we built a plugin architecture and those plugin architectures are for different purposes. Like, our corporate directory, our corporate policies, right? It's all of our bucket of data for corporate information and health benefits and all those things. Um, our directory is kind of like, you know, employee directory, those types of things, project databases. Token's really interesting. Uh, Token and VDC, probably two of my favorite um, plugins because there's so much data there, gigs and gigs and gigs of unstructured data. Uh, VDC is just all of our Revit knowledge, just, you know, it's all currently lives in like a... Um, uh, it lives in a massive uh, OneNote notebook that mm -hmm. all the VDCs use across the company and they search in there and you know, searching's okay in there. It's not too bad, right, in OneNote. Um, but this is just much faster and much easier, right? And because that OneNote got so big, 
there's hundreds and hundreds of sections and pages. It, it, it can be complicated to find stuff. And then token is uh, what we call our tech ops knowledge network. And this is a location on SharePoint with just thousands and thousands of design memos, code change announcements, all the things that our engineering folks um, need to get out there to, to our engineers. Um, and this could be, hey, scenario situations where, hey, I know local jurisdiction code calls for this and this and this, but we recommend upsizing because of X, Y, Z scenario, right? Lessons learned from, from building engineering designs and things of that nature. So there's a plethora of our most senior engineers' brains focused in that area of unstructured data. Um, so it's really, really exciting to kind of have that level, level of information available to anybody, right? Steve, um, a quick... So you could fire. Well, Sorry, just, just ask a quick question along those lines. I'm sure, you know, inev inevitably there's going to be some data that's either out of date or potentially wrong, right? Even, you know, there's always bad information somewhere. Have yeah. you all, uh, have you put in any kind of a feedback loop where if, if, if information is identified, it can be flagged and then the system can learn from that? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, so we use a, a, for all of our software, we use a feedback board, right? Where folks can go in there, report bugs, you know, report um, different feature requests. We don't have something live iterative in here with the exception of, Excuse me. Um, anyone can get a good answer and then hit thumbs up or love. You know, these are the first two things that kind of pop up. And those positive sentiments are what we'll use in the future to kind of do some fine tuning in the model, right? Like, hey, you answered some great things. Here's this. Uh, we don't have a negative sentiment in there today. They have to go to mm -hmm. uh, to our feedback board and actually submit that. Yeah. So, um, but this is still in beta, and that's something we're considering. You know, can I tell Meg, hey, that previous answer was actually out of date, right. and you know. Submitted as a bug report or something like that. Um, those are all certainly uh, possible. So I'll show you a really easy plugin. So we just typed help. This is kind of like our initial help plugin where this comes in really fast. It's static text. It's not actually using any AI or anything, but it just kind of gives people like, first thing people are always going to ask, how do you use stuff, right? So it gives them some examples of what to search, how to search, those types of things, you know, pretty, pretty standard stuff. Um, if I come in here and let's ask, you know, how do I submit? um an expense report so this will go and hopefully get us to the right location for data so that's the first decision point right which location bucket is the right one to go to based on the user's question right so it'll say hey i'm answering from this plugin and then you can see it's it's streaming that information that is coming from our data so this is not an llm making anything up this is not an llm saying what it thinks it is it's give, being provided data and regurgitating that and maybe massaging it based on how the LLM would like to you know, predict the next word based on the, the, the neural network. So, and then you have uh, uh, you know, links to the source documents. So what's kind of cool here, what was really complicated for us to figure out was, well, if there's five answers to a question or a, additional data from these, all these different documents, like, I want to get as much information to you to answer your question, but I want to separate that information out. And how do I, how do I let that user know? So we, we provide all the additional related links in here that may be relevant to that user's question, but the LLM has the capability through instruction, it's told it's okay to add a consolidated answer. So not just one answer rules them all, and I just pick the first top search result, and that's what I use. No, you can make a more concerted effort to be a bit more cohesive. Uh Right and a bit more contextual. I think uh, I think um, referencing back to the the sources of the information is an important piece of of building that trust too. It's like in these early stages when you get an answer, it's like, well, here's the answer, but here's the source. Right? It's like you're citing the sources. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So we didn't do this in the early alpha testing, um, the first version of this that saw you know public users, and that was the first thing they said. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's cool, but I need to see where it's right. from. And I need to go validate. Trust, you know, but trust verify. Yeah, verify. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and it's funny because I've had that same conversation with other developers who are doing the same thing in the enterprise for different enterprises, not just AC sector, but others. And that's the first thing they have to tackle is, hey, people want to know where it's coming from. They want to validate that information. And so, so you we said though, like that that's coming that. from like huge OneNote documents or a, a SQL database. So when you click on a link, like where does it actually take you? Um, they could be various locations. So like this, this is a SharePoint. So this is in some SharePoint folder somewhere that 
looks like finance and accounting. Um, so, so these can all be in different locations across different sectors of the yeah. business. Uh, yeah. But this particular plugin, most of its data is, is uh, you know, unstructured content in SharePoint. So, so will it take you to yeah. a specific location in a huge OneNote Correct. or will it just take you to the, the general folder and then you have to search it uh, to find? No, this will actually, we have it set. So it'll actually open the file directly right there. And yeah. deep link. Okay. You can yeah. you can build like deep links into the documents and stuff. Mm -hmm. right? Anchor links. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Most of the documents aren't built like that because they were just Word docs that people have made. Um, but you can do that. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, I'm going to show you a little bit different one. Um, so this one is actually going to work, look through structured data. So we just talked about unstructured. Now we're going to go through structured. Structure is a lot tougher to get right. And um, this one is actually doing some database searching. It's, uh, you know, AIs writing SQL queries and answering SQL queries and all these really complicated things. That's really, really tough to get mm -hmm. consistently accurate because while AIs can code really well, they don't understand your data structure, and there's a lot of tough uh, things to kind of, uh, uh, there's a lot of challenges in there that a lot of developers are having um, to really kind of think through and how to solve right now. And uh, we were really lucky. Like, this is a very hard thing. If I didn't have the collaboration with our data team to say, hey, let's massage the data side to work better with our, our product, it would have been almost impossible, right? So if somebody said, hey, just go build this thing for, uh, you know, Johnson Controls and here's their database with, uh, you know, 5,000 columns of data, that's going to be really difficult, right? LMs get confused really easily, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to structured data. So we were able to kind of get a good marriage there to give it just the right of data, not too much data, and keep it really focused on the data we want it to answer from. So it doesn't even mm -hmm. have access to a whole bunch of other stuff, right? And it only has access to the things that we want it to query. There's no social security numbers in here, no, that kind of silly stuff, right? Um, so it's very, very um, you know, restricted as to what it can have. And, and you, know, you don't want it to have uh, access to go crazy and delete tables, right? So it's read-only access, all those types of protections. You just got to kind of think through. But you can see here, it's, it's actually doing queries to the point where it can summarize and quantify. So it can tell you, hey, we've got 71 people in the Las Vegas office today, right? Uh, one I really like, uh, we just added this functionality through analytics. We saw people were asking, um, let's see, how many, uh, how many, let's say, licensed mechanical engineers uh, are in the state of Nevada. Hopefully this works, but it should work. So this was something we didn't really have this level of data exposed. And oh, see, see, that one's actually answering, I think, from the wrong plugin. It should be answering from Dur. So I'll do that again. Um, but it's it should be searching through a new set of data that we added in and then answering and quantifying from that. So so this is one of the challenges right now is picking the right plugin. So you'll see here it's actually answering from our token library when it really shouldn't be. It should be answering from our directory library. So as soon as it stops responding, I'll go ahead and, and ask that again. While it's thinking about this, uh, can you talk a little bit about, you talked about uh, IMEG does a lot of acquisition. And so mm -hmm. you're acquiring these other firms that I'm sure have, it's all over the map, the level of sophistication of their databases and where their data is stored and how it's stored and if it's structured or if it's not. So th is your data team responsible for ingesting that and figuring out the best way to bring all this together? How, how are you dealing with that in an ongoing basis? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have a um, a full team that does the um, integration of new acquisitions, and they have kind of a, a graduation process, which can take, I believe, around a year to two years. And so throughout that process, right, they're transforming or they're getting onto our networks, they're getting their data transformed into our data sets. They may have software that's really useful for us that we may take and integrate. Uh, they're mm -hmm. getting trained on our existing software. So there's a full team that does that process. And throughout that process, one will do that evaluation. And we haven't had to do too much of that because this is such a new product. But as we consume their information, the data team typically figures out how to get them onto our vantage point, our sales force. So we shouldn't have to, um, they, they do have to consume it and ingest their, their previous projects and all that data. But that shouldn't really affect like I want to have to do any coding changes on our team side because this knows how to talk to that data set already. 
So it becomes a little bit simpler from that perspective. But I will say on the acquisition side, this is a really valuable tool for that. Mm-hmm. And the reason is um, uh, we, we've been seeing people searching just, hey, give me contact information for this, this, and this person. And they don't know where they are located, but they need that information to go put into some other workflow they're doing. And we had this right. just this week, we had somebody who was doing this over and over and over. So our PO reached out to him, hey, why do you keep searching for A, B, and C people? And, you know, it, it, well, she's like, oh, I'm doing this and I'm copying and pasting it into here because it has to go in this report. And we're like, oh, interesting. So these emergent features kind of come out and we don't know all the workflows people are going to use today, right? We don't know all the questions right. people are going to use. So having that non-deterministic method for them to search whatever they want becomes a really big value, especially for new acquisition folks, right? Someone comes out of the company. Who do I talk to for HR yeah. issues? Who do I talk right. to for this? Hey, who's the CE in this office? Who's the licensed engineer here? Because I think we got a bid on this project and I don't even know if we have licensed engineers in the state. Those are the types of things that we try to make this system help them with. Mm-hmm. Um, so so this question finished, which was not the right plugin, but, uh, and then this one here, I actually fired the directory plugin directly and said we have 13 you know engineers in that, in that state. So, and I could list them out, but I want to put people's information out here, but. Um, so here's another really fun one. So let's do, let's do more engineering question, right? So here's one of how do I size a, a wire for a 50 horsepower motor? Um, I'm mechanical, so I wouldn't know off the top of my head, but, uh, there's a lot of ele- electrical engineering data. There's some NEC code data. So a lot of this information can be kind of put together in a cohesive answer. So you'll see it's answered from a couple different sources, elevator design guide, Pump, you know, fire pump design guides, VFD bearing pitting. I don't personally know what all these documents are, but the information lives in that document and it's able to regurgitate it and find what's relevant in all those documents and bring it to the forefront. So it's really cool the way that works. That kind of makes me think, Steve, uh, you know, some of the first experiments that I was just using chat GBT, you know, a year or so ago, experimenting with, and I would ask, I would ask, you know, kind of, testing what you were doing there are some technical questions and it would give me answers back. And I was like, well, I don't even, I don't even know if that's the right answer or not the right answer. So it was back to that, you know, yeah. hallucinations. You know, and right. uh, I think you're right about the, you know, if you can, you can say, just be verbose, don't, you know, give me, give me just the short version of this. And then if you don't know, tell me, you don't know, instead of just making something right. up and, uh, some of the experiments that we've been running, you know, we've been using those kinds of approaches to it. And it's like, just give me, especially if you're asking it technical, I'm not asking you to write a, uh, a flowery, uh, you know, CV, you know, description of me for some, uh, you know, for, right. for some description of my past history. <laughs> so I, I want real data, real answers. I don't want any fluff in there and to make sure that these, because I think this is an audience you know, that, that ultimately I'll, I'll bet, I'll bet within IMEG, a lot of the engineering, you know, people with an engineering hat on, it's like kind of fun to play with, but I want real data, real answers. No fluff. Yeah. That's good. hundred percent. hundred percent. Like well, we've already, other, oh, sorry, go ahead, Evan. I was just going to say that, that prompt engineering is changing all the time as well. So if you mm-hmm. teach somebody how to do it today, it's going to be different a year from now or and probably in a lot shorter amount of time than that. But like, for example, Mid Journey 5 to Mid Journey 6 changes, changed prompt structure significantly. They made it a lot simpler. You can enter a much simpler prompt and still get really amazing results now with, with 6 versus 5. And, and so I think that's another interesting point to make about this is like there might be things you need to include in your prompts today that you maybe won't need to include later. And it's just keeping everybody educated on the best way to prompt these systems is a moving target all the time. Yeah. And, and yeah, the prompt engineering happens behind the scenes, right? In our plugins and all these things. And we noticed we just went to um, you know, the newest version of GPT-4 Turbo. And from GPT-4 to GPT-4 Turbo, the prompts change. From 3.5 mm-hmm. to 4, the prompts change. So we were right. like, all right, we're ready. We're going to go with faster model. We upgrade this thing. And all of a sudden, Oh, it's not responding the right way it was before. Like, what's going on? So you have to expect that because the inference engines are just natively different, right? With these yeah. LLMs. So, yeah. so that's, you know, a little bit of a risk. It's like, hey, let's go this faster, better, smarter, cheaper model. But 
you do have to put some investment in there and gets back to the unit testing. Well, how do we batch test it? How do we, you know, so there, there is a lot to consider with that um, as the technology changes. And also, if you want to start exploring things like, hey, let me go test a open source model, right? Hey, I can host my own model and I can cut out these open AI costs and I can go, you know, put a Mistral model in here or a Llama 2 model and fine tune it, whatever the case may be. Yeah, you can do that. What do you lose with that process? Right. right? You might save some money, but you lose all those protections. You open yourself up for liability potentially of this thing going off the rails and Meg having a bad day. Or maybe you get hallucinations now because it doesn't know how to handle the same prompting to keep it in line. So there's a lot to consider there. And it could be, a, it's kind of a prompt engineer's more fine art than a science at this point, for sure. Steve, we've had a, sure. a couple of uh, episodes before this. We've had uh, people on talking about the governance, you know, around AI. What's the, what's the govern governance? What, what are people thinking about from the ethics side? You made a couple of comments, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about what Either either you're starting to think about and driving within IMEG or there are others within IMEG that are trying to kind of put a framework in place to think these things through, but can you tell us what's going on in that front? Yeah, and that that's an important topic. Um, you know, I've talked and touched a lot on, you know, the ethical side of things, right? Um, and and then you have to think about the data side, right? Where's the data going? And so I think Microsoft and OpenAI's marriage and their partnership that they have right now is really, really well put together. And, you know, um, Satya and Microsoft and their leadership really had good vision on this, right? I mean, they invested a lot of money and they're going to make a lot of money on co-pilots, but they really thought about the enterprise because that's their customer, right? Their customer is the enterprise. They property, don't want their data. Right, that these are intellectual yeah, property. They, they, it doesn't matter if I'm not surfacing IP information here or not, but if it's user information, any of that, they don't want to leave it. So what, what um, you can do with, with Microsoft's uh, framework is you can host your own version of those open AI models within your own ecosystem, right? Or your, your cloud, if you will, on your Azure stack, and that data stays in there. So the residency of that data doesn't leave, um, which is really important for a lot of enterprise customers. Uh, and then the other piece to that is, you know, all those protections we talked about. Open AI is the farthest along, but there is also an additional layer for security that happens at the time of inference that open, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, Microsoft has with their OpenAI Studio. So you can actually go in there and every LLM call or every call to, you know, whatever model you've got hosted, it can run through a series of checks and it has a severity warning. And one could be for, you know, whatever ism you can think of, there's a whole bunch of them. And you can say, hey, you know what, um, I'm okay with a medium on this but I have a high strict on this, high strict on this, high strict on this. You can really lock it down or expand it depending on your use cases. And so they've really, and, and there's more they're doing there, but they have a whole team that's literally doing nothing but solving that problem and making sure their models are safe to use, uh, especially in an enterprise environment. So, you know, if I'm giving any advice to anybody who's going to try to accomplish something like this for, uh, uh, you know, their firms or, you know, the Microsoft stack is probably the best place to start with, in my opinion, the safest mm. place to start for sure. In enterprise, there are so many different departments, right? You have an HR department and a graphics department and a marketing department and, a, you know, you've got all these different. So how do you handle permissions when it comes to this thing? Because like you said, like there's no social security numbers in there, right? But I would assume HR might have access to an HR Meg version of Meg or something where, where it ha maybe has things like that. It, how are you handling things like that? Because I know firms are going to be asking questions like that. Well, we've got all these departments. You need some kind of ability to lock things down. Some information is for everybody. Some of it's only for some eyes. So how's that work? That's a great question. So we've basically solved that by just saying Meg is only going to have access to the data that you want everyone in the company to have access to. Okay. And we just drew a line. We just drew a start straight there. line there. We, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's get that right first. And then we'll start thinking about, well, I want an HR version of Meg, right? Or I want an electrical engineering only version of Meg. I don't ever need to see this, you know, mechanical stuff. And we've had those requests too, right? So we had to start somewhere and we wanted to be safe with what we were starting with. So let's just not give it access to anything that's sensitive right off mm -hmm. the bat. Mm -hmm. And so in order to do that with our ingestion um, tech stack, our parsing tech stack, which was you know, consuming all this data from all these places in real time, uh, we had to build a whole admin center for that 
where our product owner can work with our librarians and know, hey, this is a safe location, subscribe, not a safe location, don't subscribe, block, whatever. And also work with a data team to say, hey, these columns can come in, these columns cannot, right? So security column, get rid of that, right? Um, so those are the types of things we had to do in that process just to make sure we're safe. Just to make sure we don't give any avenue for any information that's sensitive to even make it in here at all. I think there's another can. kind of way to build on top of that because I've had this experience too, which is th there's a, there is, there are safe things to be shared in safe ways in say safe channels, but not everybody knows what those are. So a lot of private information is shared via email, which is completely mm. open, but everybody thinks it's my email. It's right. totally private. Like there's just this weird feeling about, about these things. They're, they're not truths, right? They're just myths that, that have been embedded in people. So when it comes to that kind of stuff, I mean, have you had to broach that subject with, with anybody yet? Or, or how are you dealing with that? Not too much. Um, you know, we have, we basically have librarians and this, this, um, librarian level of, uh, what we call mega librarians, right? But those could be a person in HR, a person in, uh, our tech ops engineering team. They're kind of the, um, the main points of truth for what goes in and what goes out. Right. And so they're the ones that really are focused on the data sources. And so, you know, I can't monitor that stuff. Our product owner can't monitor that stuff. There's just too much happening in a large organization. And we're only a couple thousand employees today, and not to mention a couple hundred in India, right? So we, we're in, who knows who we're, about, who we're acquiring and adding to the team tomorrow. So we need people with that distinct role to have that as their job. Mm -hmm. um, and they need to be, be trusting, they need to have the trust in the system that, hey, when I put things here, I know they go to Meg. When I put things here, they never go to Mac. And so we had to build that really clear for them and yeah. give them analytics so they can it's see. It's like a flow chart. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we, we have some cool tools, which I'm um, unfortunately not at liberty to show today, but um, you know, we have this admin center. It makes it really easy to do that process for them. Uh, and then we also have uh, you know, really intricate analytics and BI reports of every single file. And not every single file is going to be able to even be parsed, right? Like, let's say you get a PDF that's just a static image. We're not parsing images today. So, you know, well, if I expected to have that data in Meg as a librarian, well, how do I know that one image didn't make it, right? So we have to have those analytics for them and, and, and dashboards for them to be able to see that so that it can be, a, we're trying to get to be a fully self-serve model, right? Sure. Um, so you don't go to development because development's expensive, right? It's always the slowest thing. So we, we always, we always say like the process for our teams internally is if you need to visualize data in some way, you go to the data team first, they'll go query your data, they'll get in a power BI. And if they can accomplish what you want, they'll do that. If they can't, they'll kick it to the dev team. We'll build you a custom dashboard or a custom, you know, project management tool or something like that. And we've done, we've done various of those for different departments as well. So it's just kind of a. That's kind of how we do that delineation and figuring out where this project should go. So we uh, we uh, didn't talk, Steve, but is the primary interface through Teams interface where your where the bot interface lives? It is today. Yep, it is. Uh, one thing we do have um, we are having conversations potentially at surfacing in other places. Um, this kind of falls in line with kind of wait and see approach right now. Um, all of our plugins, we call them, um, all of those functions or plugins, um, they are uh, built to a certain standard where they could plug into ChatGPT and be run serverless in the cloud or something like that, each individual yeah. one. So we're kind of, I just kind of want to wait and see right now. Teams is what was our decision because this is where we all communicate. Like this is 99% of our company communication that is internal and informal, all happens here. And then obviously, you know, stuff for projects that goes external, goes on emails and things like that, that nature. Um, but yeah, we really thought Teams was the right place. It was harder. It was much harder. I, I, I would have much rather just built my own UI because then you have full flexibility, right? You can have your own chats going on. You can do all sorts of different things UI-wise. You're really restricted with Teams. You can see in the text streaming here, they actually don't even have a text streaming feature. So we actually had to do something to get it to do that. It's not even natively built in. In talking with the Microsoft guys, they're trying to figure that out, right? So, because they're trying to build their own code wallet. So we're all kind of in the same boat. So I'm like, this is where we want to be. We know Meg will probably live here for long term, but it may also surface in maybe another web page. Maybe we have a tool that's a project management tool 
where we may have a version of Meg that plugs into just that data on that screen, right? So we can kind of uh, reuse that code base in different places because of the nature of how it's built on uh, being open. Great. Yep. Well, we, uh, uh, we, I think, covered where you think this is going to go next, you know, when, when you were talking about, um, you know, really the kind of behind the scenes of some of these workflows in the apps and uh, some things that, that might be manifested. But uh, what uh, for those out there that are listening to this and, and beginning to think, either working on things themselves or thinking about it, what's kind of your advice for getting started? What are some of the first things? That, where did you skin your needs that you can maybe help somebody else uh, avoid some of those mm -hmm. pitfalls? Yeah, that's a great question. There's there's just so much knowledge to consume on this topic and it's everly changing, right? Moving like quickly. Uh, daily. Yeah, yeah daily. Um, I think you got to be a hobbyist first before you feel comfortable enough to go and execute for for you know for work uh, for your project. And um, I would say just really start understanding, you know, dive into prompt engineering. That's something you just do in chat GPT's playground with a free open AI key and uh, start playing with that, understand those principles. And, you know, it's really hard to try to say, hey, go understand how neural network works. Nobody understands sure. how those things work, right? Like, unless you're a data scientist at OpenAI, and even they'll tell you they don't understand how half their emergent, you know, patterns are happening. But, um, and then I would say, you know, the data part is the hardest part. Like, like building a chatbot is actually one of the easiest pieces. Solving the data is the hardest thing in a company, right? Because you need buy-in, you need collaboration. You can't just go and dev that, right? You've got to have folks want to clean their data, want to organize their data, want to get into places that are consumable, want to sort it. That's the hardest part. So I would say really work with relationships that you can that you have in your company with IT and all these business unit leaders, and start having that conversation today because it may take six months for that data to be consumable or in a consumable fashion, consumable state. Um, it takes a long time to clean up data. Uh, we've been we've been live company wide with a beta release uh, since the beginning of January. So we're, we're just going on one full month. Uh, we had alpha release for a couple months before that, or a limited group. And you know we're probably going to continuously work with our librarians and filling data knowledge holes and cleaning data and outdated data. Probably for it may, may never perpetuity. stop. Yep. Honestly, yeah, honestly, it makes sense. Yeah, it just never really stops. So. Yeah, it's going to require constant attention. I have a question about quantifying costs and an investment. And, and I know that may is probably difficult because you have so many people involved across different teams in different roles, but ballpark, what is, what is IMEG invested in this? And then over your one month of beta, like what kind of return on that investment or satisfaction even have you been getting for feedback from people? Because I assume that this is an investment that will cut down on how much time it takes to find stuff, right? Like the whole idea of exposing and bringing this data to the surface quickly and accurately is a huge, has a huge ROI. It has huge implications across a, a organization as large as you are. So just to give other firms an idea who are, who are not going down this road yet, but may want to, like, what, what are we talking about here? Oh, it's a great question. And, you know, I don't have hard numbers today because we're so early, but we're yeah. actively tracking analytics and looking at those numbers and where they're trending. But I can tell you um, the conversations have been, you really got to look at what's the bar today and where's that bar set. And mm. for us, but in a lot of the AEC industry, the bar set, let's talk on structured data today, SharePoint search. Yeah, sure. I'm not trying to rag on right, SharePoint. Right. It's come a long way over the years, but <laughs> it's not what you're seeing here, right? So that bar is kind of low as far as yeah, that goes. Right. Um, so the feedback and the sediment has been over overwhelmingly positive from users, from directors, all the way up through the food chain, uh, CEO all the way down. Everyone really loves this, right? They really love having access to data. Um, I will say the structured data side, right? Um, we have wonderful reports, BIs all over the place, and that's accessible today. And that bar is graphically better than this bar, I would I would say, right? Like you're getting graphics and slicing and dicing. It's actually better visuals, but the speed is still better with a chatbot. 
right? Because now I don't need to go and slice and dice 15 different filters in my Power BI report to get the exact one. It's, it, I just type a sentence, I'm, I get it five yeah. seconds. So while we're quantifying that, we expect it to be significant. And the larger scale of a company as you are, the higher the headcount, we expect that, that ROI to be equivalent to, you know, uh, in scale literally with the size of the firm. Um, I will also say there's a lot of intrinsic values we have not even identified yet. And we're hearing about them daily. Like that use case I told you earlier, somebody was copy and pasting from Meg to do some other workflow. We don't even know what half of those are today. And where Meg sits today is very much a really good search engine, right? Like a conversational search engine. We haven't even built workflows in yet. And so that's where, hey, can I go get a, can I just ask Meg for a prequal for a project, a hospital project? in the city of Las Vegas and let it go make a pre-call report for me. And that saves somebody three hours, four hours. I, we don't know yet. So when we, as we mature workflows this year, it's going to just, the ROI is going to continue to go up. Um, so sorry, I got skate around <laughs> that one. I don't really know today, but we feel, and the numbers show it's, it's going to be pretty significant. Yeah. I think another big part of that investment is just having a team dedicated to development, not necessarily AI development, but you do have a team of six people that is dedicated to development and solving problems by creating software across the everything that that includes. And so the company is already set up to go down this road in, in some respects, right? Where other companies right. may not have those resources good, at their fingertips good, because they haven't done oh, that. I'm sorry. That's a good setup, Evan. I was going to, I saw Steve that you're looking to add some people to the team. Well, here's your here's your chance to uh, yes. reach our global audience of the Confluence podcast to kind of put out there some of the people that uh, you're looking for to add to your team. Yeah, we uh, you right now we're interviewing um, actively for folks with Revit ABI experience. Uh, we have a lot of full stack engineers that are not from the industry that have a lot of, you know, traditional full stack experience and we're looking to add in more Revit API experience. Um, and so we're looking for that, that person right now. And then, uh, we're continuously adding, you know, we've added a couple devs last year, adding more devs as we go. Um, and so I would say if you're interested, please reach out to me on LinkedIn and be happy to have a conversation. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, as, as you know, because I've been, uh, trying to twist your arm, we're doing this one day confluence event around AI and machine learning in April. It's April 17th. It's going to be in, uh, actually at the, uh, Brooklyn Navy yard in New York city. So that's underway. Um, hopefully we'll figure out how to get Steve there to be part of this. Uh, but, um, uh, it should be a, a great day for those of you that are interested in, in this topic, diving in a little bit more. Um, um, so anyway, you can. Uh, Evan, I guess we'll put in the show notes a link so that people can get to that and sign up for more info. Yeah, we'll put a link to that and we'll put a link to Steve's LinkedIn page so you can get in contact if you feel like uh, this is a path you want to explore with IMEG and his team. So, yeah, my Steve, thank you so much. This has been super fun conversation. Like, I love, like, the whole purpose of this podcast is to go behind the scenes. And we officially achieved that today. And thank you okay. for, for your willingness to share with the audience has been a fantastic learning experience. I have a feeling we can, yeah, thanks for I have a feeling we can have you back on here like every six months and have yeah, this much or more, different. right. To, to talk about, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's really cool. It'll, it'll be fun, right. We will try to, we'll give you maybe a little bit more than six months to get, get some of uh, these results under your belt, but we'll have you back on and, and, um, you can report on, you know, just how well this is, uh, this has been, uh, in the rollout at hot Meg and, uh, it's exciting. I think as you said steve it's like an exciting time we're at this pivotal point right where it's like you know i think a lot of the yeah. things that we probably people our age I'm, I'm not throwing you under the bus steve i'm, I'm a few years old got a few years on you but <laughs> um but it's like you know things that you've always kind of imagined and it's just like eh, you know you're not going to write code you know for all this so i think it's just opening up this new thinking about just what the interfaces to all this information can look like and yeah just a really exciting time. So I appreciate your coming on and, and sharing this with everyone. Even how you write code, right? GitHub Copilot now, like these are, these are, it's completely, uh, it's crazy. It's absolutely uh, incredible. I, I've seen developers on my team that, you know, were, were you know, really sh would, would not have the speed aspect. They were really thorough, but they weren't, weren't very fast. But having that AI Copilot with them to shoot ideas against, it's like, oh, hey, have you tried this? 
and they may massage and tweak it, but their velocity yeah. has gone up almost 50% from some of these guys. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. So cool. And then your newer guys, it's a little danger with the newer guys. I'm a little concerned about that. And they don't know enough of what the AI is doing. And, you know, so there could be some concerns there, but the ability to learn as a newer guy now by seeing code written live for you and then learning from it, and then it can explain it to you right in your ID. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's really, really helped uh, developers across the globe. It's been a game changer. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again, Steve. We appreciate your coming on. Looking forward to seeing right. what you're doing next. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.